Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security, and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world, education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism, alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Will Indiana finally pass hate crimes legislation? It's one of several issues legislators will consider as they work to craft a budget. Ahead, what to expect during this year's legislative session. Adopted Hoosiers can find out more about their roots because of a law that took effect over the summer. I want to pass on information to my children and their children um, so they know where they come from. But getting that information is taking longer than expected. And the key to getting funding for early childhood education may be framing it as a workforce issue. Had it just been about early childhood education, I think that no one could have denied the benefits. But had it been something that an economic development organization would partner with and take such a role in, no. Quality child care could be a tool employers in the state use to lure in qualified workers. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Lawmakers gaveled in the 2019 legislative session yesterday and they are set to tackle a number of issues ranging from workforce development to medical marijuana. It's also a budget year, so lawmakers will have to figure out how to fund the state's needs for the next two years with limited resources. I sat down with our State House reporter Brandon Smith earlier today. We began by talking about hate crimes legislation, an issue the governor has said he wants lawmakers to address this session. So Indiana is just one of five states without hate crimes legislation. Of course, Governor Eric Holcomb is really pushing for this. Other legislators haven't been able to get it done. I'm guessing this is going to be a headline item at the State House this year. Yeah, without a doubt, that'll be one of the things that occupies the most attention, even if not the most time at the State House this year. I'm personally not sure how it's going to go. As you mentioned, uh, this has been tried in a serious way the last three sessions or so, and it's been getting progressively worse each time. They've, they've made less progress each year. But as you also pointed out, the governor is throwing a lot of political capital behind this. So I, I, again, I'm still personally skeptical, but it certainly has the best chance it's ever had. The Trouble Department of Child Services has been underfunded for years. Um, they're asking for more money. If they get that money, how, well, first of all, what are they asking for and then what will they do with that? Well, it's a big number. It's $286 million a year more than they got in the last budget. But it's also important to remember that that's not necessarily new money in a sense. That's the money that they've been spending for the last year or so. They got it over the last year or so in one-time money. So now lawmakers have to figure out how to do that on a more sustained basis. Uh, that is a lot of money. It'll go towards the things they've already been spending it on, which includes um, hiring a lot more caseworkers and, and staff attorneys, um, helping fund all of the things they need for the sort of explosion we've seen in children in the system. And then they've also been raising the salaries of all the existing uh, DCS employees. So a lot of that money will go into, is just a result of so many more kids that they have to deal with. Medical and recreational marijuana is becoming more available across the country. Uh, medical marijuana becoming more available in states surrounding Indiana. Do Indiana lawmakers plan to tackle this issue this year? Uh, there are lawmakers on both sides of the aisle who will certainly offer bills and want to push for that uh, this session. We know that already, but I really don't see it going anywhere. And that's because 
The governor has said absolutely not. Legislative leaders really aren't sold. Uh, the law enforcement community, the Indiana Chamber of Commerce are, have come out against that sort of thing. So it faces a really tough uphill battle. I don't see it happening this session. There will probably be some sort of debate around the issue, but it also feels like one of those things that they won't be able to help hold off forever. Now, lawmakers are also putting together a two-year state budget that will take effect July 1st, correct? Right. So, you know, we just talked about the Department of Child Services wanting more money. Everybody wants more money. How do lawmakers fund these initiatives, but yet still try to maintain a balanced budget? That will be one of the more tricky things they have to deal with this particular session. And a big part of that is because of two things. One, DCS and that huge budget increase that they're looking for, as well as a significant increase in what they'll need for Medicaid funding. Um, those two things put together take up pretty much all of the new money that lawmakers, lawmakers expect to have per year in this new state budget, which leaves everything else wondering where are we going to get our money. Um, there's already discussions around taking DCS's number down a little bit. Uh, Republican uh, legislative leaders have said maybe we'll ask if they really need all of that $286 million a year. Um, they're also working with agencies to come up with more manageable budget numbers, but it's a crunch for them this year, and they're, that's very much in process how they're going to deal with that. All right, ready, set, go, huh? Absolutely. We're looking forward to your coverage this spring. Thank you very much, Brandon. Thank you, Joe. Thousands of adopted Hoosiers are hoping to learn more about their birth families thanks to a law that went into effect in July. The state closed adoption records from 1941 to 1993, making it hard for many to get information about their origins. The law makes most of those records available to the children who were put up for adoption. But as Barbara Brozier reports, getting access to that information is taking longer than some people expected. From the moment you step into Kathleen Anderson's home, it's obvious family means a lot to her. Pictures of her relatives are scattered throughout the home. My daughter, she always gets how much she looks like me and sounds like me. My oldest son looks more like his dad. But when it comes to who she looks like, the picture isn't as clear. Wanting to know my roots, um, wanting to know who you look like, who you take after. Anderson was adopted as an infant. She has pictures from that time, but very little information. I kind of always like this picture because it really captures to me like the essence of who they were at that point in time. So proud to have me as their daughter. Her adoptive parents told her she was born at Methodist Hospital in June of 1968. They agreed to raise her Catholic as part of the adoption agreement. And Anderson later found out her mother was just 16 years old when she gave birth. But that's not enough to satisfy her curiosity. I guess I've just always wanted to know, um, you know, what was my parents' story. She may eventually find out. A law that went into effect in July opened up previously closed adoption records. It gives Hoosiers put up for adoption during that time access to more information, which could include their birth mother's identities. Anderson filed the required paperwork shortly after the law took effect and expected to get the requested information within a few months. I had expected at the time that I filed that, you know, maybe around Thanksgiving or beginning of December I would have it. Now I'm thinking it might be more like March or April. The Indiana State Department of Health is in charge of processing the requests. The agency didn't make anyone available for an interview, but a media relations representative said in an email, the state has received more than 3,300 requests under the new law. It's fulfilled just over 860 of them. The agency says it could take more than 20 weeks to process each request. We are continually looking at ways to decrease the processing time, including hiring additional staff, because we know this information is very important to those who are seeking it, the email says. Anderson says she's frustrated by the long wait to get her information. Legislators passed the bill two years ago, but waited to put it into effect until 2018. The thinking was that would give the state two years to prepare. Anderson says she's not sure why the state didn't allocate additional resources to help, but she's hopeful she'll finally get answers to her lifelong questions. I never 
thought I'd even get this opportunity. I've waited 50 years. I, I, a couple more weeks, months in the grand scheme of things isn't that long. It's not that bad. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. Republican State Senator Randy Head is proposing a bill this year that would address another issue with the adoption records bill. It would make it clear people are entitled to copies of their adoption records rather than just getting the opportunity to inspect or copy the information by hand. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Indiana University Health has visitor restrictions in place at two children's hospitals because of the uptick in flu cases. The State Department of Health says three people have died from the flu so far this season. Last flu season was considered severe with 336 deaths. The Environmental Protection Agency is taking a second look at the legal basis for a rule that limits air pollutants from coal and oil fired power plants. Experts say that could lead to the rules undoing and therefore more coal pollution in Indiana. The Obama era rule considered all of the hazardous pollutants that were likely to be reduced by these plants, not just the pollutants they were trying to regulate, but under Trump, that evaluation has changed dramatically. The EPA says the rule provides less than $6 billion in public health benefits, while the Obama administration rules put that number at $90 billion. If you quit smoking and your primary desire is to reduce your chances of getting lung cancer, you will also benefit from quitting smoking in many other ways that affect your health positively, right? McCabe says since 2011, the Obama era rule has helped the country reduce its mercury emissions by about 80 percent. The founder of a drug recovery home could return to Floyd County within weeks after the state Supreme Court revised her drug related sentence. Last year, a lower court sentenced Lisa Livingston to 30 years in prison after she pleaded guilty to dealing meth. But the state's highest court issued an opinion that changes the sentence to 23 years in community corrections, which means she could be back working at her recovering recovery center soon. A group of Hoosiers is urging lawmakers to study rising prescription drug prices. New laws could shed light on why drug prices continue to go up. Sarah Skipper is a type 1 diabetic and needs insulin to survive. She says she's been forced to ration and borrow insulin because of the cost. You know, there are generic versions out there, but why are we not able to get them? Why are we not able to have access to them? If, if there's something that we can afford, why not make it easier on the people who need it? Nearly 500 people signed a petition asking lawmakers to address the issue. They sent it to the Indiana Public Health Committee this week. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service says the Tippecanoe darter, a tiny fish in Indiana waters, doesn't need federal protection. In fact, the population may be growing. The fish only grows to less than an inch and a half long. It can be tough to spot because it lives in loose rocks on the bottom of large rivers. Brent Fisher of the Indiana DNR says a shift in the way they survey the fish is likely more representative of its true population. They were probably there, but they just weren't seeing them. Since trying this new method, method, Fisher says they found the Tippecanoe darter in places it wasn't before and in healthy numbers. He says surveys suggest its population also might be growing, likely due to better water quality in Indiana streams. Indiana's Court of Appeals recently dismissed a religious freedom lawsuit the first church of cannabis filed against the state. The Indianapolis-based church filed a legal challenge in 2015 after the state passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. A lower court dismissed the case last year, saying their love of marijuana doesn't count as practicing a religion. The church appealed that decision, but the state's Court of Appeals once again dismissed the case. State Attorney General Curtis Hill applauded the ruling, saying they could go elsewhere, but they won't be lighting up in Indiana. It's been certainly an interesting case to follow, Joe. Yes, and as we've seen at the top of the show, it doesn't look like at least medical marijuana is going anywhere in Indiana either this Not year. Not anytime soon. Thank you, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. A boat collision on the Ohio River has sunk several barges loaded with 1,500 tons of coal each. We look at efforts to lift the remaining barges out of the water. 
and just a small fraction of Indiana kids have access to licensed childcare and pre-K. But as lawmakers hope to lure in more qualified workers, childcare may become a workforce issue, and that could mean a lot more attention from the state house. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same. And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing. For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You Senate won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU news team is where you are and telling your story. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Yet another coal barge has sunk in the Ohio River as a result of a tugboat crash on the Kentucky-Indiana border last week. The boat collided with the bridge near Louisville, causing the barges to break free. As Rebecca Thiel reports, nine of the barges are, struck, are stuck on a nearby dam and seven of them have sunk. The Coast Guard didn't say exactly how much coal spilled into the Ohio River, but that each barge was carrying about 1,500 tons of it. Coal can contain toxic chemicals like lead and mercury, but the Ohio River Valley Water Sanitation Commission, which monitors pollution on the Ohio River, doesn't think it'll have much of an effect on drinking water or aquatic life. It says raw coal doesn't tend to dissolve in water, and any contamination would get diluted in such a big river. The Coast Guard is working with the Army Corps of Engineers and the responsible party, Tennessee Valley Towing, to come up with a plan to lift the remaining barges out of the water using heavy machinery. Since the water has been constantly shifting and the weather has uh, not been cooperating, the Coast Guard shift is, shifted its focus to salvage efforts. So far, the Coast Guard says the barges are not affecting traffic on the river. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Rebecca Thiel. Just 12% of Indiana's infants and toddlers have access to licensed childcare in pre-K. There are a number of obstacles standing in the way of expansion, including high operating costs, low wages for professionals, and expensive tuition. Now, in Perry County, a group of businesses, county officials, and individuals have worked to keep the area's only licensed childcare and preschool center open. As Indiana Public Broadcasting's Jeannie Lindsay reports, they say it's part of a strategy to attract workers and their families to the area. Three years ago, most of these kids were just learning to use words and stand on two legs. Others weren't even alive yet. And some might have never ended up here in Tell City if Perry Preschool and Child Care hadn't opened its doors. Back in 2013, we met with our major employers. A continual topic that was brought to the table by the employers was childcare and how it affected workforce. Erin Emerson works for the Perry County Development Corporation. Her whole job centers around drawing families and young people to the area because there are more jobs here than there are people to fill them. Businesses complained a major piece was missing, a quality child care center. There was a lot of in-home, but no licensed facility. People were continually running into issues um, with lack of access. Fast forward to 2015, a board of business and community leaders came together to open a center, and it's been a huge relief for some parents, like local family businessman Brad Fransman. Our son, he's going to be four years old, and, and he's really, really learned a lot just from, uh, you know, from speech, from verbal to, to physical activity. He's, he's grown leaps and bounds in two years that he's been here. There's a traditional and an advanced preschool classroom, plus three rooms for toddlers and infants. The center serves kids from all over the county. It's the only state-licensed center for miles. There are nearly 80 kids who want a spot, but the facility can only take 56 at a time. 
The shortage of spots isn't unique to Perry County. It's a statewide problem. Center Administrator Anna Seifert says it really all comes down to money. We do everything that we do here on a day-to-day, cent-by-cent basis. It's difficult to attract and keep highly qualified or sometimes any staff. Seifert says not a single person on Perry Preschool and Child Care's payroll, for example, takes home more than $10 an hour. And some have student loan debt. And I know that if my husband didn't have the job that he had, I couldn't, I couldn't afford to do this job. But more money could end up with child care providers as Indiana focuses on building up the state's workforce. Because Emerson says there's an undeniable connection between child care and the business community, Perry County's major employers have coughed up more than $200,000 to keep the center's doors open. Had it just been about early childhood education, I think that no one could have denied the benefits. But had it been something that an economic development organization would partner with and take such a role in, no. The state does offer a program to help low-income families afford high-quality preschool. It's called On My Way Pre-K, but it's offered in fewer than a quarter of Indiana's counties. A lot of lawmakers want to see it expand statewide, including to places like Perry County. But with limited state revenue, it's unlikely they'll be able to do it in the upcoming session. Meanwhile, the state's Family and Social Services Administration has made moves to study and grow community-based child care systems. But as progress at the state level trudges along, providers hope pairing their efforts with workforce development will help them make room for more, even younger learners. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Jeannie Lindsay. And Jeannie Lindsay is here to tell us a bit more about the state of early childhood care in Indiana. Jeannie, thanks for coming on. Yeah, of course, money is a driving uh, force here. Yeah. So why is child care so expensive? So licensing rules are really thorough. They cover basic things around like emergency planning and first aid, but they get really specific when it comes to food and meal planning, the features that need to be in a building, um, equipment. And so maintaining all of that with insurance and staffing costs, um, it really just adds up. And uh, providers are looking for more ways to streamline those costs, make them more efficient. But in places like Perry County, when there are limited people and providers around, um, they've had to partner with Work, workforce people, uh, employers, um, and, you know, the community. Now you mentioned that the state has been working to expand services and expand access. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, so the state has been making progress on offering more grants for providers to expand their capacity and for low-income families to access child care. Um, but more recently, the state applied for a nearly $10 million federal grant um, that will basically help the state assess Indiana's needs, um, you know, improve information sharing, uh, and, you know, grow some of these community-based systems like we're seeing in Perry County and hopefully replicate them in other areas. Now, what about On My Way Pre-K? Yeah, so On yeah. My Way Pre-K um, focuses on pre-K, um, and it helps low-income families afford high-quality preschool. Um, it's only available in 20 of Indiana's 92 counties, um, but there are some funds there that help providers expand their capacity in the non-On My Way Pre-K counties. Um, and so Governor Holcomb has said that he envisions keeping that at current funding levels, but that kind of goes against what advocates and some lawmakers are hoping to improve access for families um, across the state. So while we have you here, before you go, we just want to get a little bit of take on how these education priorities kind of fit into the 2019. Yeah, so early learning is getting more attention, especially as more people connect it to workforce development, workforce needs. Um, but Indiana's got a lot on its plate this year, especially, you know, we've been talking a lot about teacher pay. Um, lawmakers will have to figure out how much more money they want to give to schools for teachers and how to get that into the hands of teachers. Um, and then school safety is another big piece. Uh, Indiana saw two school shootings in 2018. Um, and so the governor has a report and recommendations 
recommendations, um, and lawmakers will have to figure out how to fund those or how to implement some of those things um, in this upcoming session. So another big year of education, and of course you'll be following all of it uh, through the state house and yeah. everywhere else. Right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's going to be it's going to be an interesting year yeah. with the budget. Yeah. So we'll see how it plays out. All right, Jeannie, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Bloomington residents kicked off the new year with a splash as dozens rushed into Lake Monroe as part of the polar bear plunge. Melissa Webb and her son Josh came out to do the plunge. She says it's a great way to kick off 2019. We're just excited for what God's got in store for us this year. It's going to be a good year. Webb said the experience was a thrill and it's one that goes toward a good cause. All the money raised for the event goes straight to the Boys and Girls Club of Bloomington. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security, and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding expertise results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.